so people use the word consciousness um, in a variety of ways, but often people think of more complex thought, um, self-awareness, things that are that are um, more specific to human beings. But what I mean when I use the word and what I'm interested in and what I think is so mysterious and what's so difficult for scientists to study is something much more fundamental. So consciousness in the most basic sense, which I usually um, like to just call felt experience. I think that's the best way of getting at what it is that I'm talking about. So if a bee has some minimal level of consciousness, if a worm has some level, uh, a minimal level of consciousness, and neuroscientists do not have a consensus on on these things yet, um, we think it's it's likely that they have some conscious experience because they have brains and central nervous systems. But if they do, it's a very minimal experience. You know, something like a worm or a slug might just feel pressure against their skin. Um, maybe some internal kind of desire, like like we have a feeling of hunger or something like that when it, when they need to go towards food. Maybe some minimal element of fear or even just an impulse to move away from something dangerous or something that wouldn't be um, good for their system. And so when I use the word consciousness in this context and talking about the mystery of consciousness, I'm talking about consciousness in, in its most basic form, simply the fact of felt experience. Um, the fact that I'm not just processing light waves that are bouncing off all the objects in this room. I'm seeing yellow, I'm seeing green, I'm seeing shapes, I'm having an experience for, from the inside in a way that we imagine computers don't. You know, computers and cameras can process light waves. Um, and we don't imagine that they see green or that there's any kind of experience of color or anything like that, even though they're processing similar inputs from the environment. The question is, and, and the really mysterious thing is, why does some processing, why do some organisms in nature have an experience of being the organism, have the experience of being that collection of atoms that's doing that processing. Hmm. So sentience is also a great um, term, although it's not used that often in our culture and most people equate it with life. So I don't use it that much, but the definition of sentience is really actually what, what I'm getting at here. Um, susceptibility to sensation, um, consciousness in its most basic form. So I use experience, I use awareness, um, felt experience and sentience interchangeably, but that that is what I mean by consciousness. Hmm. There's something that it is to like to be that organism yes. or life. Yes. So that phrasing um, comes from Thomas Nagel, the philosopher Thomas Nagel, who wrote a famous article, at least within the, the um, world yeah. of philosophy, <laughs> called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And he basically you know, discusses what, what I was just explaining, but in, um, in a more philosophical and detailed sense in terms of what different types of organisms might experience in the world, having vastly different sensory modalities, inputs, brains, um, that, that type of thing. And there's a great German word, umwelt, to describe, and that, that kind of covers all of the types of conscious experiences a given organism has. So we have a human umwelt and bats would experience a different umwelt because they're experiencing sonar and navigating the world through a different sense than vision. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm excited to explore the variance or degrees of sentience, mm. but you know, we come to this uh, philosophical understanding and trying to answer the seemingly impossible question of why any organization of matter would have an experience of itself. Yeah which is, you know, famously kind of noted as the, as the hard problem. And yes. so why is the hard problem especially hard as yeah. opposed to easy problems? Yeah. And that phrase comes from David Chalmers, the, the philosopher. Um, although the hard problem, you know, as a problem has been expressed many, many times throughout history, he kind of coined this great term and now we have sh this shorthand. So the, the quote unquote easy problems of the brain and neuroscience and consciousness are what what we're really at the beginning stages of now in neuroscience, which is understanding and learning which brain states correlate with which types of conscious experiences. The hard problem is why there would be any felt experience of any processing, brain processing or otherwise at all. Um, and this is very intuitive for some people. For other people, it's, it's not. Um, see, seeing how mysterious this actually is. But when you start to compare things that human beings do um, to things that other systems do, whether they're artificial intelligence systems or plant systems or insect systems, 
it's easy for us to see how other systems, um, or we intuit that other systems may not have a felt experience associated with processing. And it seems natural that human beings and maybe mammals do. Um, but when you look more closely at what that entails and what differences there are or that there really are a lack of to point to why some systems or some processing would not entail an experience from the, unsi from the inside and others would, um, it's actually very hard to come up with a reason for it. Um, it's also in terms of the sciences, science studies everything from the outside. And, and this isn't true beyond science. This is true in, in our daily lives, just our understanding of the world, of each other. Um, we are only able to study, observe, um, try to understand, experience other things in the world from the outside, from their behavior, from their physical characteristics. And so, you know, luckily human beings can communicate so well that we can get a pretty good sense of, of what we're each experiencing because we have this high level of communication and we're similar enough that we can, we can talk about how we're feeling, but I can never have direct contact with your experience. I can't know your experience from the inside. And so this is a real challenge for the sciences and for just us as curious creatures how to better understand something that you can only know firsthand in terms of the experience itself. The experience itself exists for itself and can't be really um, received or penetrated from, from any other place. Yeah. So you would say then it's impossible to have conclusive evidence that an organism or life would have consciousness looking out from the outside. Yes. So this is, um, there are two questions that I, that I raise in my book and this is one of them. And, and it's, i I pose it that way because I think it gets at our deepest intuitions about what consciousness is. Um, and it shows us how counterintuitive a lot of, um, the answers to these two questions are. And the, the first one is, is essentially how you phrased it. Can we find conclusive evidence from the outside of any system that consciousness is present in that system? Um, and while we feel that the answer is yes, and I think we're very we're correct in our assumptions about other human beings and mammals, the truth is it's actually impossible at this point in neuroscience um, and in our path as human beings to actually be able to conclusively say because the only evidence we can get is through communication. As I said, I can't jump into another experience and have that experience myself. Um, and this is actually very interesting. I've been thinking a lot lately as I've been working on my documentary series about how important communication is for our ability really to talk about any experience at all. And we can't communicate if we don't share the same experiences. And so there's this limit, you know, if I were talking to someone who were born blind and I was trying to explain something about my experience of seeing, it's extremely limiting. I mean, I could give some analogies, but there would be no way for me to explain to someone who doesn't have vision what the, my world of sights is like. The more different an organism is from us, the less ability we have to communicate. Um, and so it's easier for us to, to kind of assume we have evidence from, from organisms that are similar to us. Um, it gets much more difficult when, there, there's a la when there's an inability to communicate. And this is true with hum human beings as well. So um, in the case of, of someone who's experiencing locked-in syndrome, which can happen from um, damage to the brain, either by stroke or, or an injury, um, that leaves the patient completely paralyzed but their consciousness is still fully intact. And so that's a situation that puts us closer to where we are in terms of looking at other organisms, other life forms, um, and not being able to know whether there's consciousness presence. So if someone in a locked in state looks like they're completely unconscious, they're totally paralyzed, they can't move. Um, yet we now know based on um, some interesting stories we can talk about if you want, um, that many of these patients 
are actually having a full conscious experience. They can see everything in the room. They can hear everything in the room. They have thoughts. They have their, they're as having as full a conscious experience as, as you and I are having right now with no ability to communicate. So then what is the second question that you pose? Yeah. So the second question is related and very similar, um, but it kind of gets at this intuition from a different angle. The second question is, is consciousness doing something? It's about the causality of consciousness. Um, is it driving our behavior in the way that we feel it is? Is it informing our behavior in the way that we feel it is? And so our intuitive answer to this is, is a resounding yes, also to the first question. Bo both of our, um, we feel very strongly that the answer is yes to both of these questions I pose. And what's interesting is to start to shake up your intuitions and realize that we don't have great evidence for answering yes to either. And the answer may be yes to one or both, yeah. um, but it's surprising to dig a little deeper and realize we actually just don't know. So we feel very strongly that, you know, my experience of anger, my experience of fear, even my experience of thinking through my day and my planning, that I couldn't really do any of those things without the internal felt experience. I couldn't do those things without consciousness. If I said, um, you know, I, I woke up this morning and spent an hour prepping for this interview, but I was unconscious the whole time. It's, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense to us. So we have this intuition that consciousness is causal, that it's doing something, but there are ways to kind of break through that intuition and get you to question whether that's the case. 